One of the big uh, clues about the kind of economics Friedman does and the kind that Hayek does is based on the level of aggregation. And in fact, I came across a pretty strong claim by Axel Leonhoofen, slightly paraphrased, but right now I can't think just what the slight paraphrase was. So your aggregation scheme is your theory, is what. Well, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but not much, okay? But not much. That if you have uh, y equals c plus i plus g, and you don't get, don't give the attention to what's inside of the investment aggregate, then you're going to miss a lot. Or even more severe, if you have mv equals pq, which is what we'll talk about a lot in Friedman, m is the money supply, v is the so-called velocity of money, it's the rate of turnover of money on final output, and p uh, is the price level, uh, and q is the output uh, of the economy, and that's a, that's a pretty severe uh, equation. You have to figure out what all is in Q and and what about P and so on. What what about relative changes in prices and so on. So anyhow, your level of aggregation constrains you to the kind of theory that you have. Okay. So here's Keynes. Friedman and Hayek on aggregation. Let's look at Keynes first. It says, theorizing at a high level of aggregation, John Maynard Keynes believed that market economies perform perversely, especially in the market mechanisms that bring saving and investment into balance with one another. Seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, Keynes called for countercyclical fiscal and monetary policies and ultimately for a comprehensive socialization of investment. And that quoted phrase at the end, comprehensive socialization of investment, comes in the final chapter of the general theory. And most uh, Keynesians who look at the general theory uh, don't pay any attention to that last, uh, to that phrase or to that last chapter they just say, oh, Keynes was just flying his kite uh, for that uh, chapter. Here's Friedman. Milton Friedman's monetarism was based on a still higher level of aggregation. The equation of exchange in equal PQ made use of an all-inclusive output variable, Q. Uh, that's both consumption output and intermediate output as well. Okay. Putting into eclipse the issue of the allocation of resources between current consumption and investment for the future. Seeing no problems emerging from the market itself, Friedman focused on the relationship between government controlled money supply and the overall price level. Now, the reason I put that one phrase in green is to show you, is to tell you that. On microeconomic issues, Friedman is very, very good, okay? It, it doesn't quite dovetail with the uh, Austrians, but almost, okay? So the, there's a lot you can get out of Friedman reading his microeconomic stuff. The microeconomics, I think, is a whole different uh, issue, and we'll see how that goes. Here's Hayek. Capital-based macroeconomics is distinguished by its propitious disaggregation. And it does it right, makes, gets the disaggregation to a point where you can make sense out of what's going on during a business cycle, uh, which brings into view both the problem and the intertemporal resource allocation and the potential for market solution. Hayek showed that a coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market-governed movements in the interest rate and that uh, does work in that uh, investment sector. He also recognized that the aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank. So he had, he had it down pretty good in that uh, blurb. Contrasting methods. 
and we have two methods. One's contrasting the, the other, even though we have three economists. We'll see who, who has what here. So Keynes, Friedman, and Hayek on method. We'll start with Keynes. Keynes was the type of theorist, this comes from Alan Meltzer, who developed his theory after he had, had developed a sense of relative magnitudes and of the size and frequency of changes in those magnitudes. He concentrated on those magnitudes that changed the most, often assuming that others remain fixed for the relevant period. That's the way he went at it. And I've suggested that uh, a particular tool that he uses uh, for his theorizing, and I call it a variation sieve. Uh, there's the sieve. It have to, it'll have to be changed a little bit to make it, make it work like Keynes needs to. Uh, he simply pours all of the C and I and G and everything else through the sieve and see which one hangs up in the sieve and which one goes through. Anything that has a lot of variation back and forth will stay in the sieve. Anything where there's not all that much variation it goes through the sieve and uh, becomes no part of his theorizing. He only theorizes about what's going on that's, that's, uh, ca that's captured in the sieve. And it turns out, uh, as you probably have already guessed, that one thing that goes through the sieve is the interest rate, uh, especially in, in uh, booms and busts as we see them. That what we, what we tend to see is a lot of the booms, and especially the one that, that uh, occurred in the 1920s, were partly, but only partly, they were partly genuine booms. Uh, there was all sorts of things going on. Uh, automobile manufacturing, uh, lots of chemicals of one sort or another making things better, uh, refrigeration, uh, electricity, and so on. There were lots of things going on during the 30s uh, that caused lots of people uh, to borrow funds in order to uh, further these kinds of activities, okay? Um, so that was a genuine part of the boom. But to the extent that they were borrowing and, a lot, and doing a lot of borrowing, that would drive interest rates up, wouldn't it? Interest rates would go up. Of course it would. Supply and demand. More people are trying to borrow more stuff in order to take advantage of the technological breakthroughs that happened during the 1920s. All right. Now it turns out that interest rates didn't go up, or they didn't go up very much. And the reason they didn't is because the Federal Reserve was pumping in money to keep interest rates down. All right. Uh, now for Keynes, or for anyone working in the U.S. and looking at this uh, situation, uh, if they were using the variation sieve, they'd let the interest rate go down the drain, go through the sieve. Right, uh, so it, it's sort of a bad strategy to just look what's what's changing the most. Now here's Friedman. What's his view? Well, he says I believe that Keynes' theory is the right kind of theory in its simplicity, its concentration on a few key variables, and its potential fruitfulness. So he's he's doing the same thing as Keynes. All right. And when he says potential fruitfulness, what he's thinking about is that, oh, oh, uh, all, of this, all of this data that we can get is just what we need with our econometric equations, <laughs> okay? That's the fruitfulness, okay? So it's, it's a, a econometrics approach uh, to business cycles. And yet uh, that approach uh, is not gonna work too well because what turns out to be the key thing in the interest rate and the way it's uh, juggled by the Federal Reserve is, is one of the big problems, or is the big problem. But it went through the sieve, okay? The implications, as Friedman pointed out, is that big effects have big causes. Well, that's not always true. I mean, sometimes it's true. 
uh, if you think of uh, if you think of volcanoes destroying cities or something like that, you had a big volcano and <laughs> destroyed city. They're both pretty large. Uh, but a lot of times, a lot of times you have a, uh, something that you that you really can't quite savvy until you figure it out about what's going on with interest rates. Here's Friedman. We're all Keynesians now. We all use the Hmm. This is yeah. This is Friedman, and he says we're all Keynesian now. We all use the Keynesian language and, and apparatus. Uh, well, no, that's not right. <laughs> the Austrians don't use it, but so he's just thinking about the Keynesians and the monetarists. Now here's Hayek. The role of the economist Hayek points out. This is in Pure Theory of Capital in 41 is precisely to identify the features of the market process that are apt to be hidden from the untrained eye. All right? He says that in, in Pure Theory of Capital. Uh, and what he means is that is precisely about that interest rate that doesn't seem to change. Okay, so Friedman and Keynes don't pay much attention to it. And Hayek does because he knows that it should have changed. It should have gone up when lots of people were trying to borrow lots of funds uh, to take advantage of technological uh, uh, aspects of, of the... Okay, so for Hayek, then, the cause and effect relationship between the central bank policy during the boom and the beginning of the economic downturn as the first order claim on our attention, despite the more salient co-movements in macroeconomic magnitudes that characterize the subsequent spiraling of the economy into deep depression. In other words, there's a serious link here between, between what happened initially when there started to be a downturn, and the downturn happened because there were too many resources being used and there weren't that much savings uh, going on, as we heard in the last lecture, uh, and that's what caused the economy to crash. And when it when it started crashing, it kept crashing, and there, and there, there was all sorts of uh, ill-conceived measures to keep it from crashing that actually made it crash even worse. So those two things are very much tied together, the initial downturn and then the deepening into into very deep recession. And here's what Hayek said. This is in his uh, Pretense of Knowledge lecture when he won the Nobel Prize in 1974. He says there may well exist a better scientific evidence, and he has that in scare quotes, <laughs> uh, that is empirically demonstrated regularities among key macroeconomic magnitudes, but what, what makes them key is a, a lot of ups and downs, okay? So interest rate wasn't key because it didn't change much, which will be accepted because, of the, because it is more scientific, against in scare quotes, than for a valid explanation which is rejected because there's no significant quantitative evidence for it, all right? That was Hayek. How methods shape substance, we'll see. Identifying the cause is what we're looking at. Keynes attributed the downturn to psychological factors affecting the investment community rather than to monetary or fiscal disturbances. That really is, I mean, he's, he's gone off of economics onto psychology here. We've got psychological factors. I suggest a more typical and often prominent explanation of the crisis is the sudden class collapse of the marginal efficiency of capital. Is that an explanation? <laughs> you might note the sudden collapse and wonder well, why it happened, but uh, that's what Keynes came up with. Keynes' make is, uh, main focus, however, is on the dynamics of the subsequent downward spiral and on policies aimed at reversing the spiral's direction. In other words, 
it's just out of sight for him to think about what's going on with interest or anything else during the boom. It, it's only when the bottom falls out that he, that he was to take a look and see why that might have happened. And psych, psychological uh, is what he came up with. Okay, here's Friedman. Friedman is dismissive of the whole issue of cause and the initial economic downturn, referring to, and I've, I've noticed this in the literature, referring to it as a, a usual, ordinary, routine, normal, run-of-the-mill, garden-variety recession. <laughs> in other words, the initial downturn is just key to understanding what's going on. That initial downturn is something that that Friedman just blows off. Okay? We're not we're not concerned about that. Those those things happen a lot. All right. What we're concerned about is why it dived into deep uh, depression. For Friedman, the correlation between the subsequent movements in the money supply and the movements in total outcup output leaves no doubt as to the central issue. Okay, period. Now, here's Hayek. Hayek focuses on the policy-infected aspects of the boom, that is, artificially low interest rates. And you see, when I say artificially low, I don't really mean that it really dropped. It just, it just didn't go up, okay? It would have gone up just on the basis of technological considerations, but it wasn't allowed to go up, so it was artificially low. The post-bust relocation of labor and capital takes time, but the actual dimensions of the recession, its length and depth, are to be explained largely in terms of policy perversities that hamper the recovery. Right? So Hayek certainly had that right. Okay, so for Friedman, the full analysis of the business cycle consists almost wholly of an empirical accounting of the depression's depth and length. For Hayek, the Austrian business cycle theory is fundamentally a theory of the unsustainable boom and the subsequent reallocations of misallocated resources. Accounting for the actual depth and length of the depression that ensues requires an economic and historical account of each particular episode. So you see these two economists, Friedman and Hayek, are looking at different aspects of, of the boom bust. There's a paper by Eichmann and Michener uh, that Friedman had some thoughts about. Okay, Eichmann, Barry and Chris Michener, 2003. The Great Depression as a Credit Boom Gone Wrong. That's a Working paper number 137. So here's what uh, Friedman says about it. Eichen Green's paper is excellent, clear, well-written, thoughtful. There is little in it that I can disagree with. At the same time, I share the views expressed by his discussants, Michael Bordeaux and Charles Goodhart. Well, they're both monetarists that it does not contribute much to the key issue in question. Again, there's that key issue in scare quotes. <laughs> the issue is whether the depth and seriousness of the Depression is attributable to what took place during the 20s or what took place during the 30s, right? So he just wants to say that that deep depression that's all just 1930 stuff has nothing to do with what was going on in the 20s. Well, it has a lot to do with what was going on in the 20s, all right? And here, the only item, and I underline the only, the only item that has any bearing on that is the correlation of his measures of the credit boom with the depth of the subsequent depression. Here, he gets a positive correlation of 0.43 for the height that measures the stock market boom. That's pretty low. The bulk of his evidence is, is that what happened in the 30s explains the 30s, not what happened in the 20s, okay? Uh, well, 
once again, it's not a matter of how far it went down and and how big a, a dive it was related to the earlier boom. In fact, he doesn't relate it to the the earlier boom. And that's the problem. Okay, just to drive the point home, uh, I subject you to this, the, the, the case of the cabbage-eating Mississippi monster. And we'll see how that goes. Suppose that in late October 1929, a thousand-pound monster descended on Mississippi soil. It spent the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and quite a few rabbits between Tupelo and Pascagoula. By early March 1933, the monster weighed 4,000 pounds. Wow. Two investigators are sent to Mississippi to get a handle on the situation. One's from Vienna and one's from Chicago. There they are. And I actually, I Googled Mississippi monster and that's, uh, that's all, what I got. So <laughs> I guess it'll work. Uh, the Viennese investigator asks, where in the world did this hideous thing come from? It turns out on further investigation that the monster was the unintended consequence of some ill-conceived government-sponsored bionic project. Seemed like he nailed it there. The Chicago, Chicagoan shows up, shoves the Austrian aside and says, never mind how this thing got there. The key question is, how did it grow from 1,000 pounds to 4,000 pounds? How did an ordinary, usual, routine, run-of-the-mill, garden-variety monster quadruple weight in 42 months? Okay. <laughs> the Chicago's answer, of course, is it was all those cabbages. He couldn't get good data on the rabbits. The strong correlation between cabbage consumption and weight gain of the Mississippi monster leaves no doubt as to the central issue. Right? Now, that pretty much overlays what I've said before just with, the, with the business cycle. That's the whole point. So do we expect that uh, data availability is what led the Chicagoan to his conclusion and that the lack of hard data pertaining to the monster's origin caused him to be dismissive of questions about where the thing had come from, of course. These and related suspicions are what underlie the message of Hayek's Nobel address on the pretense of knowledge. Now, <laughs> something about this. I spent time in Menlo Park when the Institute for Humane Studies was there. In fact, it was at the same time that Hayek spent it uh, at that same institution, which was very helpful to me. I was working on my dissertation at the time, and it was nice to have Hayek next door, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I had heard from a number of people that uh, Friedman, who, who I knew drew, drove a Cadillac, I'd heard that, uh, had that as his license plate, MV equal PQ. Uh, and so the Institute of Humane Studies was walking distance to Samford. You could sort of cut through a little bit and be on campus in no time. And so I took my camera over there. This is about one of the last days I that I was at the Institute. Uh, I'm walking around parking lots to see if I could find uh, his car. Okay, so I knew I was looking for a Cadillac and I knew what license plate I, that I had to have. Well, it was a hot day and I just plain old couldn't find it. But I did find this Cadillac. Uh, it's a late 19... 70s model and it has California tags and so I took a picture and then did a job on that uh, license plate because I, I wanted I wanted to show it to my students and I so showed it to the students at Auburn and eventually I fessed up and said well wasn't really his but that's you know that's that's the story and it is and it is the story uh, but then later, see what we got here. 
Well, okay, we're, we're going to go with this and I'll come back a little later about the, about the car. I think I'll have time. So with a near constant velocity of money and output Q growing slowly, movements in the price level P largely reflect movements of the money supply M. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's Friedman right there. So if you have just a little bit of uptick on Q, V has a bar over, it means it's not changing. And the money supply though is, then that's going to give rise, of course, to an increase in prices, almost as big as the increase in money supply. But for the increase in Q, it would have been exactly uh, the amount. And of course, Friedman claimed that it was money that caused prices to go up. A lot of people on Capitol Hill uh, were claiming that it was prices that caused money to go up. <laughs> Prices are going up, and so the Fed has to increase the money supply so they can pay the high prices. <laughs> no, we'll give it to Friedman. He's got the right direction. Uh, with a lag of 18 to 30 months, you wonder why it would be that long. Uh, and the answer of how it would be that long has to do with the structure of production and all the stuff going on in Friedman, in, uh, uh, with Hayek. But... But Friedman just reports, well, it's 18 to 30 months, and sometimes he reports even a larger span. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, he says. So Friedman's monetary rule, increase the money supply at a slow and steady rate to achieve long-run price level constancy. And so if that Q goes up, then M should go up too. That's his, that's what he thinks should happen. Okay. And that would keep price level constant. Well, it would. But what happens within the Q aggregate as a result of the monetary injection? So he's, that Q aggregate is just plain old Q. What's going on within the Q? And that's what Hayek has to say that it causes, it causes prices to get out of, out of whack. And it comes from that diagram that you've seen in an earlier, in an early, earlier show. Okay, so it shows that even even keeping the price level constant, uh, it still uh, disturbs the equilibrium of the market. Friedman declares the 1920s as the golden year of the Federal Reserve. He ignores the interest rate during the 1920s because it didn't change much. That is, they fell through the Keynesian, Friedmanian's variation sieve. But what if they should have changed, but weren't allowed to? During the 1920s, breakthrough in technology increased the demand for loanable funds and put upward pressure on interest rates. But the Federal Reserve, guided by the real bills doctrine, met each increase in the demand for credit with an increase in the supply, thus keeping the interest rate from rising. And seeing no, little or no change in the interest rates, Friedman dismissed interest rates as a potential independent variable in his econometric equation. Well, he had to dismiss them because if they're not changing, you're not going to get any results from them. Now, uh, this is Hayek seeing little or no change in the interest rates when they should have risen owing to the technological advances and the consequent increased demand for savings, uh, Hayek was able to identify some critical market forces hidden from the untrained eye. Query, which view, Heidman's, uh, Friedman's or Hayek's, is more firmly anchored in the empirical historical circumstances of the 1920s. I think Hayek's is. Now, when we talk about this plucking model, let me ask the show of hands, has anyone ever heard about the plucking model that Friedman have? No, no one has heard for it. I'm not surprised at that. Uh, Milton Friedman, the plucking model of business fluctuations. It was an economic inquiry in 1993. Uh, however, it came from an article that he wrote back in 1964 when he was at the Bureau of 
economic research in Washington, all right? And it turns out, just by happenstance, that before this plucking model here came out, uh, I had found that stuff in the 1964 uh, rendition, the plucking model. And I wanted to write a comment uh, criticizing it. But you never get that published. If, you, if, I, if I'm trying to write a comment somewhere around 1990 about something that Friedman wrote uh, in 1964, <laughs> not going to be published, we're sorry, okay? But it, it turns out that Friedman wrote a comment, I'm sorry, uh, Friedman wrote an update on his plucking model uh, in 1993. And the, the occasion was that economic inquiry, uh, that journal, uh, had a birthday party for Friedman and his 80th birthday. He was born in 12, 1912, and it was 1992 that they had the party. And they wanted him to write something for economic inquiry. And he didn't know what to write. At that point, he, he was through with monetary theory. He had done lots of other things. Uh, and so he went back to this 1964 piece and revived it and put it in economic inquiry. Uh, at which time I was jumping up and clicking my heels because now, <laughs> now I could write a comment. And I did write the comment and sent it to... Uh, economic inquiry. I actually also sent it directly to Friedman. Uh, and it did eventually get published. But let me show you what it was all about. And, and this is really uh, peculiar. Well, you see how it goes. Uh, here's a uh, vertical axis. I say real output or real income or employment. The, any of the big, big aggregates can serve uh, on this graph on the horizontal axis, it's just time, and it's showing that the economy grows. There's the economy, it's, it's growing, it's tipped upward, okay, fine. But it turns out that uh, it, it doesn't grow in that smooth a way, that there are problems along the way. And the way that, uh, Krieg, that Friedman uh, explained it, he said it, it's as if we take a string, he said string, a string that's, that's glued at the bottom of that plank or whatever that, that's called. You glue this string, string at the bottom. But then here and there it gets, the string gets plucked down. Uh, and there's a lot of plucking here and it goes like this. Now if that's a string, it's a strange string because it, needs to be stretched. It's more like taffy, I think. <laughs> okay, But that's it. And Friedman identified, if you look at, the, at this three ep these three episodes, on the left is a bust, and then when the economy gets back on track, Friedman calls it a boom. Well, that's not a boom. Uh, it's just a recovery. And now it's on the string again, it's on the plank again, and then you have a bust and another boom, and then a little bust and a little boom, all right? He says, that's, that's what we're working with. That's what we've got to figure out, all right? And then he notices that, look, the bust in that middle is a whole lot bigger than the boom before. That's what it looks like. And then the boom uh, in the middle is big compared with the bust that succeeds it, all right? So he even said, we really don't have a boom-bust sequence, we have a bust-boom sequence. But that's just, mis he just misidentified a recovery for a boom, all right? But this explains why he is so adamant about saying that the downturn doesn't have anything to do with the previous upturn because the previous upturn is is not a boom really it's a it's a recovery all right and also I can point out that he never shows the string going above 
and in in a uh, in a boom that's an artificial boom, it shows the economy going above what its what its uh, upward movement would suggest. Right? It's getting overconfident, over investing, which which eventually gives you the buzz. So that's the story here. There's Friedman. I like that picture. Uh, okay, so here he says the empirical evidence supposedly shows that we simply do not have boom-bust sequences to theorize about. We have bust-boom sequences. Friedman takes this empirical study, initially published in the annual report of the National Bureau of Economic Research, is being utterly inconsistent with the von Mises theory. And he goes on so far as to claim that this one little bit of evidence is decisive refutation of von Mises. Really? I mean, even my, when I went back to 64, I was thinking, before I actually heard the, the, the new version, I was thinking, oh, he can't really have believed that. He probably even forgot he said that. But no, he brought it out, put it in the economic inquiry. Okay. Have the von Misesians in any way stopped saying exactly what they were saying for 50 years? Not a word of it. They keep on repeating the same nonsense. <laughs> That's Friedman. Right? Oh, okay. I guess this, this goes back to my, my Cadillac here. Uh, Greg Mankiw's blog. He was on uh, television and he asked, he asked this question, it came out of the blue, how can you identify my car? Well, we, we want to look for something pretty special. Well, it's EC10, you know. It's not very imaginative, but there it is. And then there were some comments. You know, I hate to spoil things, but I must say I think Milton Friedman had a better plate. Uh, this is from an article I came across. He says, years ago, trying to find the Friedman's apartment in San Francisco, I knew I was the right, in the right location when I spotted a car with a license plate that read MV equal PT. MV equal PT is Irving Fisher's version, and T stands for transactions. All right? uh, Friedman couldn't work with that because you can't get data on total transactions. This is a whole lot bigger than uh, income, so it can't be that. And then someone else writes, and Milton Friedman's license plate was MV equal PQ, not MV equal PT. Well, there's several different ways you could say it. Uh, but this, this helped me. I was happy to see it was PQ uh, because I, I had to sort of guess at just what the thing was. And let's see. Anonymous writes, this is pretty ridiculous. Okay. Somebody else writes, I love economists. Okay. Now... It turns out that I think I can get to the internet and there, there's a, there's a, there's France. Okay. And if you stroll, and here it is, La Vauture de Milton Friedman. Okay. I don't get to see that. Oh, <laughs> I had it on my website too long. <laughs> so I'm still wondering. Now here's Friedman, MV equal PY, and Y is income, but that version is actually wrong. Uh, it should be MV equal Y, because Y here is, is a real variable. But this is the best he could do, and so this is what he got from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And I've... <laughs> And what he needed, if, if you want to say MV with PY, you have to have a, a little Y, a lowercase Y. That's what Friedman and all the rest did, a lowercase Y. And so here I could say, you know, I've, I've heard recently that the only person that has, that has uh, had an argument with Friedman and, and won. Can you guess who? 
It was Rose Friedman, actually. <laughs> but now we've got a second one. It's the girl that was working uh, in the motor vehicle department. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Friedman. <laughs> we don't have a lowercase y. It has to be. So that's the story. Okay, thank you much.